Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Good morning Catherine. Catherine. Good to see you all here again. Some new faces, too, as well. I'd like to share with you something um, from the diary of St. Faustina this morning, found in Notebook 2, in regards to confession. Um, it's not the easiest sacrament to understand or to participate in, obviously. And for many of us um, who love the sacrament, who understand it through this as a tribunal of God's mercy, another well to go, in, go to as often as we need, I think coming together at some point and having an understanding, as St. Faustina shares with us, but also, you know, we are human beings. And we do need sometimes something concrete, something to sink our teeth into. And I have that today for you. So along with this teaching, there's something else for you to hold on to and to take away with yourself. In Notebook 2, Entry 637, St. Faustina says, Confession. As I was preparing for confession, I said to Jesus, hidden in the Blessed Sacrament, Jesus, I beg you to speak to me through the mouth of this priest, and this will be a sign to me, because he does not know at all that you want me to establish the congregation of mercy. Let him say something to me about this mercy. When I approached the confessional and started my confession, the priest interrupted me and started to tell me about the great mercy of God. And he spoke more forcibly than it had ever been, than I have ever heard anyone speak before. And he asked me, Do you know that the mercy of the Lord is greater than all his works? that it is the crown of his works. And I listened attentively to these words, which the Lord was speaking through the mouth of the priest. Although I believe that it is always God who speaks through the lips of the priest in the confessional, I experienced it in a special way on that occasion. Jesus has more to say, because as Father was saying, it's not just making penance or doing penance, offering something up. It's about a conversion that needs to take place. And this opportunity comes to us every Lent. And for for every Lent, it's important for us to, whatever we're doing, to let it sink deep within us and to cause some kind of change to occur, some challenge, some conversion, deeper conversion. In other words, turning closer to Christ, even identifying with him on the cross. Jesus gave me to understand this one day and kind of brought it home for me. In my book, A Call to Trust, Jesus asked, my people, I put these three questions to you. Yeah, he just lays it right out there. He doesn't need to pull any punches. He really doesn't make things difficult to try to trip trip us up. He says it. My yoke is light. Here it is. My people, I give you these three questions. Is your daily walk a living example of my love? Is your daily walk a living example of my love? Are you truly walking in my footsteps toward Calvary, the crucifixion of your selfish desires to the transformation of my love? Are you truly walking towards Calvary? Are you truly walking in my footsteps toward Calvary, the crucifixion of your selfish desires? to the transformation of my love? Do you trust my love enough to live an honorable life? Do you trust my love enough to live an honorable life? 
live, walk, breathe, pray as my anointed people. Be a person of honor and love. Let's take it from the beginning. Is your daily walk an example of my love? Now it goes right back to believing, not only believing in Jesus Christ, but believing that we are his beloved child, that we are a beloved of God, that we are made in his likeness and image. Who are you? Who are you? Do you believe that you are made in the likeness of God? Do you believe that you are his beloved? Well, I don't know about you, but when I was young, my parents had certain expectations. And I know they wanted us to behave, but they also wanted us to behave, especially because we were a reflection of them. And if we went by company's house and we misbehaved, which didn't happen too often because my dad would just give us this eye, or my mom would raise her hand, we knew right away, shape up, because it was a reflection on, on my parents. My parents looked at us children, and they looked at themselves. How good of a job am I doing? So if my children are unruly and misbehaving, making a mess or whatever, or talking back or calling someone by their first name who's an elder, we never were allowed to do that. We had to call them Mrs. or whatever. It might be Mrs. Catherine or Mrs whatever, and if we were closer than that, we were expected by my parents to call them auntie or uncle, Zia or Zio in Italian. It's more familiar, but still. So are we a reflection of God who gives us everything, even death on a cross? And what parent what good parent wouldn't give their kidney for their child if they needed it, or an eye, anything. God tops that off. And Jesus asks us, is your daily walk a living example of my love? Are you truly walking in my footsteps toward Calvary? the crucifixion of our selfish desires and the transformation to the transformation of our love. Are we truly walking towards Calvary? What does that mean? It simply means doing the stuff that's not easy to do or that we don't want to do. Like forgiving when we've been hurt. You may sometimes want to nurse that a little bit, hold on to it, make that person pay, or just can't find it in us. We need to be a reflection. Folks, it doesn't matter what we feel like in our insides. It doesn't matter what's going on in here. What matters is what we do, what action we take. We receive all the benefits from practicing the virtues when we do the right thing. And eventually, the heart, the mind, the gut all catch up. And it all comes together, but it first takes the will to take that step in doing the right thing. To crucify our selfishness. Maybe complaining. Complain too much. You didn't move the car seat up after you drove my car. You didn't dry the dishes after washing them. You didn't pick up your socks on the floor. Hmm? Crucify. Crucify. Crucify these things, the gossip, when you could say something nice instead of something negative. That's a transformation of love. That's being transformed into the stinking flesh that we possess, to the loveliness, the holiness, the beauty that is Jesus Christ, the goodness. It is Jesus Christ. Do you trust my love enough to live an honorable life? 
This is a biggie, friends. This is a biggie because it involves depression, anxiety, shaky knees. Do we trust Jesus enough? Do we trust his love enough to know that he will take care of us? We got all these presumptions and ideas and thinks, thinks, thoughts. <laughs> I was just testing you. <laughs> all these thoughts in our minds of what we want, what we must have to have happiness. Yet, does anyone know what's tomorrow, what tomorrow is going to bring? It might be a totally different situation. Anything can happen with God. Anything. But we push and we push and we push. And that push and push and push makes us nasty people. We can't get things fast enough. We don't have it just the way we want it. We just don't have enough. Something is on sale and we got to have three of them, three different colors. Cabinets are full with stuff. Don't touch my stuff. Stuff. How much stuff makes us happy? Really? And we got to unload it all and have a garage sale. <laughs> we need to lighten up. We need to do without, and I beg to differ, we do need to make penance. We do need to not eat that chocolate all the time. If chocolate makes you so happy, then once in a while, if you find difficulty in anything in the spiritual life, then don't eat that chocolate, but make it known to Lord. I'm not eating this for love of you. Or I'm going to kneel down six times, although I find it difficult, for love of you. Yes, you can enjoy your chocolate. And you can have peace to sit and say your prayers. But not every day, not all the time. That's not that. We have to be an imitation of him. And we have all been slackers. This generation is a generation of slackers. I want to confess my sins from my lazy boy chair. I'll need to go to confession. I'll need to go to mass. I don't have to be with all those church people. They're all hypocrites anyway. Get your butt out of bed. Get into the confessional. Humble yourself before God who died on the cross for you and for me. Confess your sins like a big girl and a big boy. Say you're sorry. Make amends if you can. And then receive Holy Communion with purity of heart and purity of intention. Not perfection. Not one of us are perfect. That comes in heaven. But we must try. And it's a journey. And he doesn't say we have to do it all at one time. He gives us a length of time. Whatever that is for you and for me. We can't just go around assuming. No way. We have to be imitators of Christ to the best of our ability and submit to his holy will. And guess what? That surrender, as hard of, as it is walking up to it, is the most freeing thing when we do it. When we surrender everything, it's not being ignorant people. It's trusting in him that he will give us the light and the wisdom of when to stand or when to sit, when to eat or when not to, when to speak or when not to speak. All imitators of Jesus. You know, they were ready to stone this woman a couple of days ago in the scriptures. They went up to Jesus. What was he doing? He was playing in the sand. He's just thinking, you're not going to push me. You're not going to push my buttons. I love this person. I even love you who are trying to kill me right now. You will not disturb my peace. And anyway, anybody who here has not sinned, throw the stone or the rock. Right? That's what he wants us to do. 
He doesn't want us walk, running around or wasting our lifetimes like scatterbrained people, all anxious and tied up in fear and misery and, and worrying about constantly about tomorrow. He'll take care of you. He promises. And he will. Remember, the greater the trust, the greater his mercy. In any situation you find yourself in, or you're becoming anxious, or you're on the threshold of sin, remember, the greater the trust, the greater the mercy. Jesus says to live, to walk, to breathe. Pray as my anointed people. Be a person of honor and of love. They go together. It was so beautiful when we were children, when we, we behaved, because our parents rewarded us. Not with iPods, iPhones, or any of those kinds of things, but with love. They were not sparing at all with hugs, kisses, and kind words that helped us to grow strong and to know love, the love of Christ. And so I asked you, who are you? You are the hands, the feet, and the heart of Jesus Christ. That's who you are. Your walk should be a daily walk, wherever you are, towards crucifixion, towards Calvary, the crucifixion of our selfishness, our pettiness, our anxieties, and the, the stuff that separates us from Christ. Our walk is to be a people of honor and love. And yes, yes, he wants us to love the porcupines in our life, too. People that are porcupines are very wounded people. They've been hurt, abused, brokenhearted, whatever, betrayed. But we're called to love them anyway. And you know what? You can do it. If when you see them, you see the face of Christ. Instead of them, you just put the face of Christ over that person. And it's amazing what you can do. You do everything that you do for the love of Jesus Christ. That's your energy to do all good things. That's what will help us to rise above our imperfections. As you know, Divine Mercy Sunday is ahead of us. We have Easter and then Mercy Sunday. There's a lot of great things that Jesus has in store for us. And so, in the understanding of confession, um, in, in the requirements for the confession, I'm going to ask Brother Esteban to come up and explain that. While he's coming up here, I promised you that I would give you something to sink your teeth into for today and to hold on to all the beautiful blessings that we receive and that keeps this ministry bearing the fruit that it's bearing and doing all that we're doing, and it's, it's really the foundation is the prayers of the faithful people that come here, our prayer ministers that are dedicating themselves. I just had the testimony of another person who was very, very eyesight, uh, uh, nearsighted, that <clears throat> after being here and receiving prayer, that the nearsighted is healed, needs no glasses for that. That's no small potatoes. So yeah, we have a bell tower that's $16,000 that God calls us not to have debt. So we are all going to work on that. It's all of our bell towers. Whatever it is, God will bless us. I know that and I'm confident in it. But God is showing us by the fruit that is being born of this prayer to keep going, to fight the good fight. And to know and to be confident that everything is his. And he will give us everything that we need. Brother, would you explain the, um, yes, would you please? Okay. 
every year the same questions come along about uh, preparing for Divine Mercy Sunday. And so don't feel bad if you don't, if you have to ask, well, what do I need to do to receive the graces? Because people always ask that every single year, and almost every year they're wrong. <laughs> they're, given, they're given the wrong information. So I want to explain to you um, that there are two things that are available for Divine Mercy Sunday. And this is where people get confused. First off, the church has given us a plenary indulgence, which is available for Divine Mercy Sunday. The plenary indulgence is just like every other indulgence in the church. And so, for Divine Mercy Sunday to receive the plenary indulgence, you have to go to confession 20 days before or 20 days after. You have to receive Holy Communion on the day on Divine Mercy, which includes the vigil, if you wanted to go to the vigil of Divine Mercy. Uh, the only reason it's not mentioned in the diary is because at that time there were no such thing as vigils, vigil masses. This is something new since the 60s. You have to pray for the Holy Father's intentions, and then you have to have detachment from sin. And this is the important part, because St. Thomas Aquinas teaches us about what that means, detachment from sin. And so there, when you go to confession, there are two things that's your responsibility. It's your confession and your contrition. So of, of those two things, St. Thomas teaches us that most of the time, they're never perfect. In fact, in the Latin, it doesn't translate into 99.9% .9 of the time, but that's what we read into it. That 99.9% .9 of the time, your confession is not perfect, and neither is your contrition, what we're, how, how we're sorry for it. It's not perfect. So what does that mean? That means that we still have attachment to sin. There's a story that Archbishop Sheen tells, um, he used to tell, and he said a, he had some person that he saw for confession all the time. And he came to confession once and he said, Father, I'm so sick of confessing the same thing over and over and over again. And so Archbishop Sheen responded, well, what do you want, new sins? <laughs> and he was making the point to him that it's okay. We have those attachments to those things that happen to us during life. And so, just like Catherine was saying earlier, it's there for us whenever we need it. You can go every day if you need to. But that's something to work out with your pastor or your spiritual director about things like that. Oh, say, okay, so confession and contrition. So what happens to that plenary indulgence? If your confession and your contrition is imperfect, it becomes a partial indulgence. Because remember, a plenary indulgence, a full plenary indulgence, removes all temporal punishment for sin, which means the reparation, all those things, because remember, there's the mercy of God, there's the justice of God. Both have to be satisfied. In His mercy, we have confession. For His justice, we have penance. So they both have to be satisfied. So most of the time, 99% of the time, our, when we strive to get a full indulgence, a full plenary indulgence, we really get a partial indulgence. And so it's good. It still works. Now here's the great part about Divine Mercy Sunday is that in the diary, and the church doesn't ascribe to what's called the extraordinary promise. The church says it's okay, and if you believe, do it. But there's no official recognition of the extraordinary promise by the church. But, for those of us who believe in the message and the devotion of the Divine Mercy, the extraordinary promise is this, Jesus tells St. Faustina, remember the contrition part and the confession part? On Divine Mercy Sunday, if you receive Holy Communion in a state of grace, which means that if you're not in mortal sin, you don't need to go to confession. Just like always, if you're not in mortal sin, you don't have to go to confession for Divine Mercy Sunday. It's a good thing to go, because we always have venial sins that can be cleansed, even though they're cleansed by making the sign of the cross with holy water. It's always good to go to confession. But, for Divine Mercy Sunday, for the Extraordinary Promise, what Jesus tells St. Faustina, receive Holy Communion in the state of grace, trusting in my mercy. And remember that contrition confession part? He says it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if our confession is full, it doesn't matter if our contrition is full. His, the floodgates of His mercy are open. Only on that day. So unlike a plenary indulgence, you can't go on Monday, or you can't go, you can go on the vigil, but you couldn't go to the Saturday Mass, 
and get the extraordinary promise. It must be mass uh, for divine mercy. And the thing is, even at churches where they don't celebrate uh, Divine Mercy Sunday, the Mass is the same. It's, it's the same Mass, the same readings, the same everything. So if you happen to go somewhere where they don't have a celebration for Divine Mercy Sunday, receive Holy Communion outside the state of mortal sin with the intention of trusting in God's mercy. And you have the extraordinary promise. And I promise you, it, if you do that, if you prepare for it, and how, do we, how did our Lord tell us to prepare for it? by the Novena, which begins on Good Friday. And this year we're producing uh, a Novena that's going to be available on the internet. Uh, they're short, two and three minute reflections. So if you can't, if you have nowhere to go, you can catch it from uh, the SJ Divine Mercy website, uh, and it'll be on YouTube. And you can watch those every day, preparing yourself for Divine Mercy Sunday. Now, so guess what? You can do both. You can receive both the plenary indulgence and the extraordinary promise. And so what I always tell people is do both. Give the plenary indulgence to the holy souls in purgatory and keep the extraordinary promise for yourself. <laughs> that, that's, that's how to handle those two things on Divine Mercy Sunday. So if you have any questions or anything, please don't hesitate to call the office. We can explain it again. But those are the two things available for you through the Holy Sacrament of Confession for Divine Mercy Sunday. Thank you, brother. Appreciate that. So great grace is await us, and in, the, in that light, we're going to be passing out if two of our prayer ministers would be so kind. Oh, no. to, oh you got it already. No. We're on it. Done. <laughs> God bless you. God bless your families. Pray for us. Continue to pray because many great things are still happening. Too many conversions oh, to mention and many good things. So it's great to see you here. God bless you and your families. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.